This is the We Get Outdoors 6 in 16 interview series where we introduce you to some of the world's leading outdoor and adventure gear brands and the brains behind them. Your chance to get a real behind the scenes look into what's currently happening in the future for our outdoor brands that you love. So six in six questions in 16 minutes. Mike, are you ready? I'm absolutely ready. Let's go. Boom. Mike, who are you and why should we care? You know, I think that uh, that's an interesting question. I've spent a bit of time thinking about that one, but uh, what, I am the marketing director for a company called Duckworth based out of Bozeman, Montana. We are a Montana grown Merino wool uh, base layer and apparel company. And why you should care about me specifically is two years ago and some change. I used to live in New York City. Um, I lived in Manhattan specifically. And I think what we're seeing right now happening with COVID and the shift to working remote and working from home, the outdoor industry is obviously booming. And I might just be sort of a, a precursor prototype um, for what we're seeing, which is people are kind of seeking a better work-life balance. They're abandoning uh, old cycles and old way, ways of life that are a bit dated and unnecessary now that we have technology, like you and I speaking halfway across the world from uh, from each other. So um, I'm basically sort of the prototype of, uh, or the archetype rather of what's going on in the world and, and, and people making that shift. Superb. So New York to Montana, what a move. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's been the best decision I've ever made. That's, a, but, uh, this is a bit off script, but, uh, you see, so you've gone from one of the world's largest, busiest cities to one of the world's arguably smallest cities. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, 12 million, I think, is greater New York area, you know, sort of all the boroughs included. Um, Bozeman is 50,000, give or take, um, with 17,000 college kids uh, nine months out of the year. So. so in the school holidays, it's like a, a mortuary. It's just quiet and dead. Nobody's around. It's very quiet uh, compared to when they're running down Main Street, uh, yipping it up. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been a lot of fun though. I mean, there's a, Bozeman. We always kind of say punches way above its weight class. There's a lot to do. So um, good music, good food, good bars, good people. Um, I couldn't imagine a better place for me, honestly. Excellent. Your next job could be for the tourist office. I like it. Um, Perfect. <laughs> so what what should our listeners know about Duckworth? So like I was mentioning, uh, we are a wool, a merino wool base layer and apparel company, and we grow all of our own wool here in Montana on a ranch about two hours from here. Um, we then manage every step of the supply chain. We're 100% American made. We know the people, the players involved at every stage of the business. And that's something that our competitors really can't claim. If you go to their websites, um, they do have, you know, our supply chain, which is good. They're, you know, they're bringing some transparency and some honesty into the equation, which I think is definitely a way that businesses are trending in general. Um, you'll see that there's about 20 different countries involved across three or four different continents. And um, that just ends up meaning a lot more emissions, a lot less quality control, um, a lot less personality brought into the brand. I mean, this is... You know, we're working with real Montana ranchers that founded the company and they're managing every step of the of the process. So you're getting a lot of personality. You're getting a lot of honest um, care and oversight into every single stitch. So I think you just really can't find that elsewhere. That's incredible. So is that the thing that sets you apart from your competition or is there more? That's definitely one of the things that sets us apart from our competition. The quality of our wool is probably our claim to fame outside of that vertically integrated supply chain. Um, the sheep, our sheep live in the Northern Rocky Mountains at altitudes between 10,000 um, and 7,000 feet uh, most of the year. Um, those conditions and the weather that comes with that altitude and this part of the world, um, you know, it's ranging from 90 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 40 Fahrenheit. So that's a huge temperature gap. Um, and those sheep have to survive in those, in those conditions. And what is required of them, therefore, is a wool that they grow that has tons of breathability, tons of loft, tons of warmth trapping, crimp, um, 
it's just, it's an incredible fine fiber. And um, our ranchers have worked really hard over the years with their genetics to really bring that into, you know, a world-class merino wool fiber. You just, you can't find that in say a new, a New Zealand or an Australian wool. Um, if you think about it, wool is a secondary function of a sheep's food consumption. Mm. And so when they live in a very green, very temperate environment, they're basically growing like a lazy wool. You know, it's, it's kind of like, ah, this wool could just be whatever, you know, it doesn't need to be that, uh, that special, but up here, you know, they actually, the temperature, even in the summer will get down sometimes into the thirties, you know, which is below freezing. Um, and they need that extra layer of protection to survive. So, um, they're a very happy sheep because they grow awesome wool and it keeps them, you know, perfectly content in all climates. So it's a special fiber. And am I right thinking that, um, your sheep get to wander around free range and just amble around the hills to their heart's content? Yeah, they, they live on about a hundred thousand acres, um, give or take. And those, those sheep, yeah, they're, they're guided through the mountains, through sheep herders and sheep dogs at a pretty leisurely pace for about 364 days of the year. That one day is when they get shorn of all their wool and then they're released back into nature to go grow that wool all over again. So um, they live a, a life pretty akin to wild animals. I mean, they live in herds, in the mountains, in the prairie, in meadows, wherever, and they're you know, they're grazing on wildflowers and wild grasses. It's, it's a pretty, um, true to form operation in that way. It's, it's very old school. I like it. Old school is new school. Um, yeah, that's, that's my belief anyway. So tell me, Mike, what's the big secret thing you're currently working on that you know, your customers will love? Well, that's the thing. Um, I think it's worth talking about the big secret thing that we just released. Uh, which is our Maverick line. Yeah, it's our, it's our Maverick line. It's named after a mountain, um, a local ski hill here in Montana, which is actually um, the birthplace of the brand. Um, the The concept was formed on a chairlift there uh, between a couple of our founders, including the head rancher, uh, who's a real deal ripper skier. So that's kind of his, his home turf. But um, this Maverick line is what we're calling the holy grail of merino wool base layers. It's 100% merino wool. Um, a lot of companies will claim that and they'll add just the slightest touch of lycra or some other elastic uh, fiber to give it a little bit of stretch. That crimp that I was me uh, mentioning in our wool, it actually adds a natural elasticity. So this stuff is, is very um, high performing and it's a completely natural um, garment. You know, there's, it's, it's all, um, it's all wool fiber. So, I mean, you can't really beat that. You can't find that anywhere else on the market. And when you couple that with the fact that all of that wool was hand selected at the, at the moment of shearing to be in that garment, uh, you know, select and destined for its end use right then and there, um, and then made, um, completely in the United States. It's, it's a one of a kind product. I'm actually wearing the t-shirt version right now. Um, it's hard to see cause it's black. Uh, but <laughs> this is what I wear under one of our sweatshirts, a powder hoodie. And then I wear my ski shell and that's all I need here in Montana when it's like, you know, zero to 10 degrees. It's crazy. Um, the amount of warmth that this, this very lightweight, uh, comfortable, soft fabric can pack is just in insane. Cool. And tell me, yeah. um, a lot of people are so this is off script again, but we're just gonna go for it. A lot of people associate uh wool with itchy and scratchy. H how does that feature yeah. your garments or not? So that is some well, that's something that the wool fiber that our sheep grow basically starts to account for. It's very fine. Um, again, you know, if you have a sheep that's living like those ones in Babe, for example, where it's like rolling green hills and the weather always looks you know, somewhat temperate, um, they just grow this really coarse, uh, really thick, nasty wool. And you kind of think that thickness would equate to warmth. Um, it doesn't actually, when you have that nice, lofty, thin, fine fiber, that very, um, low micron fiber, and then you weave it together, spin it and, 
and create those garments out of it, you're going to get a much warmer fabric. However, we do have some fibers that are lower end on the spectrum. Um, and when we shear them, we actually test with computers um, and laser scanning to make sure that the wool is of a certain quality. And we basically put it into groups, you know, group A, group B, group C, and those coarser pieces go into things like socks. Um, they go into a proprietary wool batting, which is sort of like a down jacket insulator, um, things that don't necessarily need to be um, soft as the shirt, for example, that I'm wearing direct to my skin. You know, if this was itchy, I would obviously not be wearing it. And mm. uh, that's definitely one of the misconceptions of wool is um, that it's always going to be itchy. It's like your grandma's knit sweater. And uh, and Duckworth has really also set out to to combat that misconception and show people that, no, this can be a really soft, a very fine piece of equipment um, that if, you know, taken care of well will last you a lifetime while also doing exactly what it needs to do, um, which is wick moisture, which is to warm up when introduced to water vapor and water, which is to be odor resistant, which is to be itch free, like we were just talking about. So um, now it's, it's kind of a miracle fiber that people are just coming back around to because we actually know how to harness it in the best way um, that we couldn't, you know, 60, a hundred years ago. Yeah. This is a, uh old technology that's been forgotten about that suddenly and people thought they could do better. And I guess the answer yeah. is they can't. Yeah. If it, if it ain't fixed, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But um, we have been with sheep. We've been with wool for basically as long as we've had domesticated animals. Um, it's, it's, it's a part of our shared human experience in a way to have wool clothing. And again, people just, we just didn't have the technology. We didn't have, obviously, you know, uh, sheep herders in ancient Greece didn't have laser computers to scan the wool to see how fine it would be to make a, a nice toga. Um, but we do have that technology now and we're able to look at it and say, you know, this nature created this fiber to keep these sheep protected. Um, they're a desert animal. They're a desert creature. So they needed to have that really wide range of temperature swings covered in their in their natural fleece and yeah again we're just beginning to be able to harness that in a really meaningful way and that's what duckworth has set out to do superb so you yeah. mentioned you mentioned a little while ago um, and it may even before i maybe even before i press record the outdoor industry is booming but w what do you believe the future of the outdoor industry is you know i think the future of the outdoor industry is really going to merge with um, and you're already seeing this in, in marketing. You're already seeing this in storytelling for a lot of brands. It's really going to have to merge with um, sustainability and environmentally minded groups. And this can mean a lot of things in a lot of places. You know, at Duckworth, our ranchers, our company, we consider ourselves stewards of the land. Um, our ranchers have been ranching on the same land for about four generations now. So over 100 years. And that land has needed to provide for them in their sheep ranching operation for that entire time. So for them to be, uh, be abusive of it, for them to be um, careless of it would be a detriment to their well-being. And similarly, you know, the outdoor industry is all about experiencing those wild places, those places that can really stop you in your tracks and make you think and make you um, consider who you are in this incredibly massive world that is um, humbling all the time. Um, and I think the outdoor industry is really going to need to take heed of that and make sure that people who are buying their equipment are, are, are using it responsibly and in a way that is in line with that stewardship that Duckworth likes to hang its hat on. You know, um, Leave No Trace is one of the oldest examples of that, um, but just being also careful and um, and making sure to be mindful of those spaces so that they can be enjoyed for generations to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, that the outdoor industry collectively is going to need to tackle. It's not enough just to be like, you're going to be protected outdoors in this garment. It's also this garment wasn't made in spite of wild places. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, the outdoor I mean, industry can shoot itself in the foot, eh? 
Yeah, it's it's a bit ironic if you're using materials or, or methods that are to the detriment of the places that those garments are going to ultimately be used. <laughs> I love it. Though. What a thought. Yeah. How you can make money in the outdoors and screw it up to stop yourself making money in the outdoors within 20 years. That's that's like exactly. Oh, yeah. That'll blow your brain. So yeah. um uh, final question of our six in 16. Um, what's your message to all those people who get out there in the outdoors? You know, I think it's, it's tied to that last question that we just discussed is that you should definitely consider what's bringing you to the outdoors. You know, when I lived in New York city, I be six months before I moved to Montana, before I even knew I was going to do that. I some, you know, subconsciously I ordered a backpack, a backpacking backpack. I hadn't owned one in a while. I don't know where my old one was from when I was a kid. And it sat in my New York City uh, Tribeca office next to my desk for about six months. And obviously what was happening with me is that I was thinking in my head, I need to have that freedom of space. I need to have that connection to, to nature that you just don't get in a place as dense and as urban as New York City. Um, and so consider what those reasons are and then try to incorporate that in how you approach being outdoors. You know, it's, it's definitely changed the way that I um, look at my experience out there and, and what I'm doing. You know, I used to go skiing, for example, and it was all about just getting as many runs as possible, um, going and shredding it up. And now there's a lot of runs where I'm like, you know what, this is a really easy run. There's no challenge involved for me athletically. Um, but I'm, what am I doing right now? I'm on two planks moving slowly through the trees on a mountain. You know, it's pretty amazing experience. And I think, you know, people in the outdoor industry, you got to um, just find whatever that connection is and make sure that it's preserved. And again, make sure you're, you're thinking ethically about what you're bringing into that environment, both spiritually and literally physically. Mm. Cool. So, folks, I want you to encourage. I want to encourage you rather to go f- um, find Mike on social media, but more importantly, find Duckworth. And if you find Duckworth, you may well find Mike. Um, all of the Duckworth social media links and everything else are below. Mike, thank you for your time today, and I hope twenty twenty one is an epically successful year for everything Duckworth. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure.